What's up everybody, DJ Chance here. Now in today's video, I'll be doing a tutorial of this, the Pioneer DDJ Rev 1. All right, so we're gonna begin with the layout and the design. Now the layout is definitely something that takes a little getting used to if you've been used to the older style of DJ controller that's kind of been out now for about 10 years with the introduction of the Pioneer SX series. This is representing what the battle layout would look like if you had turntables turned 90 degrees. And yes, kids, I know it sounds scary, but turntables were real. I know it sounds made up, like something your parents would tell a bad DJ to scare them into being good little DJs. Well, they were a real thing. They used to have these arms that reached out of the dark closet and they were tipped with these needles that would suck your blood out in the middle of the night while you were sleeping and just tear your soul from your body. The reason turntables started to be turned 90 degrees was for battle configuration because of those arms. You needed the arms to be out of the way of your hands, especially if you were doing body tricks. You used to have the arm on this side, on the left, you would have an arm blocking your crossfader. So if you reached over, you would knock that needle sideways. I remember the first time I saw that battle configuration was with DJ Bobcat and LL Cool J's on Bad video, and it blew my mind because I had never seen anything like that. I had always seen Technique 1200s in the normal configuration up until that point. And pretty much since that point, it started to transition into that style, which used to be known as Philly style, then later became more known as the battle style configuration. That being said, having the pitch control up here on this particular controller is more of a marketing thing than anything because the pitch control is useless kind of being up here. From a mixing standpoint, I always like my pitch faders on the sides of the turntable. I never really cared for the sliders to be up on top here. On the top? On the top. But if you were a turntablist and were using your turntable as a musical instrument, having the pitch slider go left and right lent itself better to sound manipulation, especially with tone play. It kind of matched the configuration of a piano or a xylophone because you would go to the left to get your lower notes and you would move the pitch to the right to get the higher tones. And it would sound something like this. Now talking about the pitch control, of course the pitch control is 60 millimeters now, so it's a longer throw than on the outgoing SB3, which had a 50 millimeter, so you get a much more precise feel, a much more precise increments, just a more precise mix. The tempo range is in line with everything else. It goes plus or minus eight, plus or minus 16, or plus or minus 50. So there's nothing really of note there. If you've used the pitch control, you pretty much know what that does. The other thing I like with this particular controller is that they've made the jog wheels much bigger than the outgoing SB3. They made them the same size as what was on the SR2 model, which was a bigger wheel than what you had on the SX model. So if you're someone who liked the feel of that controller with the capacitive wheel and the way that it felt, this will be a welcome addition to have that extra room to get your finger right where you need it. I love the styling of the platter. I mean, I really like what they did here with these lines. They made it look like a record. I like that a lot. I think the gold in the middle to make it look like a label is another nod to the battle configuration. Also with the marker here, that of course is useless on here. The marker doesn't work on this particular controller. So it's another thing that isn't really necessary, just like the pitch control isn't necessary to be up there. I mean, they could have put a longer pitch control on the side, but in them moving everything up out of the way there, they were able to widen the space between the platters. So this way your hands can throw back and forth better than they could before, instead of having the platters just so close together. They've given you an almost extra two inches of width here between the platters in comparison to the SB3. I think it's an inch and three quarters. And that's also to make space for these pads. If you look close to the platter, you're gonna see where it says search right there in that circle. This way you can do a track search in higher speed than you could if you were just spinning it on your own. This is it in normal configuration. But if you want it to go a lot faster, you would hold down the shift and then spin it forward and you can see how much faster that's going. Same thing with the rewind. 
three quick spins and it's back to the beginning of the track. So it's a much quicker way to do that instead of having like the finger strip search that was on quite a few controllers, including the SX line. The height of the platter off the playing surface is much higher than it was on the SB3 as well. So that's another welcome addition because your fingers are just slightly about the same height as the faders. So this way, if you want to do a scratch where maybe you're doing something with your finger on the platter and the cross fader, you can do it. Put your back into it. Let's see, you can do something like this. You'll definitely do something way better and cleaner sounding than I even tried to do there, but you get the idea. So let me give you a quick demonstration of how sensitive this platter is. So there's a brief demonstration at the sensitivity of the platter. You can see it responds very well. It's very quick. If you're trying to go from slip mode to vinyl mode, they've now moved that ability to the three and four buttons respectively. You can control the deck three or four. You can control the slip mode and vinyl mode. And how you control the slip mode and vinyl mode is that you would hold the shift button down and then press the respective button that you're trying to switch modes with. So if you're trying to get this into a scratch mode, and now you want to go into the slip mode so you can nudge you would hold down shift press the three or four button in this case I'm pressing the four and now it'll go into nudge mode now if you want to go back to vinyl mode you would hold down the shift press the button again and now you're in vinyl mode You also have the tempo range built into this button as well. So as I mentioned, this can go plus or minus eight, plus or minus 16, plus or minus 50. If you wanna change the tempo range for your pitch slider, you would just hold down the three or four button until the tempo range changed in your Serato DJ software. So let me give you a demonstration of what that looks like. You can see right there that it says plus or minus 8%. I'm gonna hold down the deck button and you'll see that it changed to plus or minus 16 there. I'll hold it down once more, and there it is, plus or minus 50%. And if you wanna access decks three and four, cause you do have four turntables on this controller, even though there's only two volume controls, you do have four decks. You would just hold down the three or the four, and when it's lit up, you are now in deck three or four instead of decks one and two. And this will also change in your Serato DJ software. When I hold down the deck three or four button, you're gonna see that the configuration changes. So we're gonna have four on this side. I'm gonna press four and you're gonna see that change. And since I have no track loaded, there is nothing there. The same thing will happen on deck three. So I'll press three, you see there's nothing there. If I press the button again, the three will go back to deck one and pressing four will bring this side back to deck two. In the Serato DJ software, you can also change what your view is. If you wanna view four decks on your screen, you would press the four button and now you have all four decks there. So you can have a good visual indicator of what you're doing. Down here, they've kept the same size play and pause button that you had on the outgoing SB3. That's not different at all. The only thing I find strange, and I mentioned this in another video, is that they didn't put any graphics at all on here. They put all these beautiful gold graphics everywhere in comparison to the outgoing SB3, which was graphics heavy. But on this one, they did away with a few things and they've given you the world's smallest Q button here. And I mentioned this in the last video I did between the SB3 and this Rev1, that this thing's way too small. I don't, I guess it can be useful. You could get used to it. I don't really see a lot of battles happening with this controller. I think it's more of a marketing thing and it looks good and you're just used to the layout. Look at the size of the Q button in comparison to the size that's on the Newmark DJ to go to touch. I mean, the Q button is wider than my finger when I lay my thumb on it. But if I cover this, the button disappears altogether. This is like a Jedi mind trick Q button. You don't need to see this Q button. Move along. Move along. Also above the turntable, you're gonna see that they've put the auto loop functions here. You've got your auto loop button, 
which also lights up in the amber. That is with all of the buttons on here. So if you want to do an auto loop, you would press in the auto loop button. It's lit up. It's ready to trigger. When you press in auto loop, the default loop length that's in the Rev1 is a four beat loop unless you configured it in the software beforehand. So let me show you what I'm talking about. When I press the auto loop, it's gonna immediately do a four beat loop. So let's see what that sounds like. Now, right next to the auto loop button, you have a half time button and you have a two time button. So if you want your loop to be longer, you would hit the two time button, which would turn your four beat loop into an eight beat loop. You hit it again, it would turn into a 16 beat loop. Again, it'd be a 32 beat loop. And that's as far as you can go. You can't do a 64 or 128 because that's the limitation of the Serato DJ software. So if we do a four beat loop like this, let's touch that button again and let's let that go. So we're gonna hit the two time button and make it an eight beat loop. Now we'll hit it once more, we'll get a 16 beat loop. And once more, of course, we'll get a 32 beat loop. Right next to the two time button, you have the half time button. Now for me, this is a more exciting half time than what you've gotten in some Super Bowls. If you want to exit the loop, you just hit the auto loop button again and it goes away. Now underneath the auto loop buttons, you're going to see there's graphics that say reloop and exit and then in and out. And this is for your manual loop or your reloop. What that means is that no matter where you are in your track, when you hold down shift and hit that auto loop button, it's going to go back to the last loop that you had playing in that track. So now we're in a different part of the song. I'm gonna hold down the shift and hit the reloop button. The one thing you have to remember is that the reloop will also jump back to the way you had that auto loop. So when I exited my auto loop, I was at a quarter beat loop. So that's exactly where it's gonna go back. You'd have to change it in the Serato DJ software on your screen to go back to a different configuration. So if you wanted to go to back to a four beat loop, you'd hit the four beat loop in your software. Let me show you what that's like. You'd have to go right here where you see this. You'll see it's at quarter beat. I would have to move the arrow forward. And let's say I wanna go back to an eight beat loop. Now I'm in an eight beat loop. You see how that lit up in blue? That means you're now in a loop. Let's set a new loop. Let's hit auto loop. We're gonna get an eight beat loop like we configured in the software. All right, so we've got this loop going right there. So I'm gonna go to a completely different part of the song. I'm gonna go to my hot cues. Now, if I wanna go back to that loop that I had, I'll hold down the shift and hit the auto loop and you'll hear it go right back to that last loop. Then you let it go and it's gonna exit, just like it says there, reloop and exit. And right next to that, you have your manual in and out for your loop. So if you wanna set a manual loop, you would hold down the shift and then hit that in and out button. Now I'm doing one off beat just so you can hear it. See, so no matter what you do, you can set it up any way you want. The other cool thing you have here is this in and out also means that you can adjust where the in part and out part of your loop is. You heard how I just had it off beat, so let's adjust that so it's on beat. Let's go back to that loop. So we wanna adjust this to be on beat. We would hold down the shift and hit the out. Now we can move the wheel till we get it right where we want it. And we can also adjust the in part of the loop. We would hold down the shift, hit the in button.
The other thing that happens when you're adjusting the in and out of your loop, it's also going to change in the Serato DJ screen. Let me show you what that looks like. So when we want to hold down, when we want to adjust that in and out, see now we're in a loop, we're in an 8 beat loop. Now we want to adjust the in and out, I'll hold down the shift like I showed you, and I'm going to hold down the out button, and you see that now it's frozen there. The blue bar is frozen, that's showing you your loop. This way you can adjust the in and out. Since we're doing the out, it's showing us the end of that loop, so we can now adjust it. And now we can do the same thing with the end. We'll adjust it from the other end. We'll hit in and you'll see that that center marker moved the loop here because that is your playhead. So now that is the beginning of your track. And the same thing. You see that it moves as you move the platter. Now we're going to jump into the part that's the most different between the Rev1 and other DJ controllers, and that is the mixer section. As I mentioned earlier in the video, they widened the space between the decks, especially in comparison to the SB3. They've given you about an inch and three quarters more space of width in between, and that's partly to accommodate the performance pads here, which I'll get to in a moment. Now the up faders and the cross fader are pretty much what you expect at everything in this price point. Pioneer has been using the same exact cross fader and up faders in their controllers all the way back to the SX. It's the same exact part number. They feel about the same. The good thing with the software is that you can control the cut of the up faders, which is a really handy feature. How you would adjust that is you would go into your Serato DJ software. In your Serato DJ software, you would go right there to the little cog wheel. You'd press that in, and then you'd go to your mixer section. And right there, there's your up fader control. This way, if you want to control it, you just put your cursor on it and move the trackpad or your mouse and then put it all the way in the fast configuration. And as you see, the crossfader also has the same control. I have mine in reverse or hamster mode which is going to come into play later when I show you one of the new exciting features that is in this Rev1 that is completely useless if you have this in reverse. And we'll get to that in a few minutes. So now if you want to do a scratch with your up faders, you can. Let me give you a listen to what that sounds like. You can get a little bit of that Mix Master Ice action going on right there. And what that also means is that no matter where you have that fader, it's going to be at full volume. So just be aware of that if you're someone who wants to get back into mixing, you'll have to go back into your Serato software, into the mixer section, and adjust that up fader curve. Now in between the up faders, we have the Q section. You've got your master out into your headphones, and you have your Q for channel 1 or 3, and channel 2 and 4. And when you press them, of course, they light up in amber like everything else in this controller. The only downfall with this Rev1 controller is that you can't control the Q-Mix. You get it how it's already defaulted with the hardware that you have. In this case, with the Rev1, if you look at your Serato DJ software, in the monitoring section of your Serato DJ software, you'll see that you have a Q-Mix and Q-Volume, which can't be controlled from the hardware. Right now, I'm adjusting the volume of the headphones on the hardware, on the Rev1 itself, and you see nothing's happening. So you can see when I hit the master volume, the Q-Mix volume is at 100% at the master. You can see that it's turned all the way to master. So if I hit one of the headphone buttons for the channel to hear what's going out pre-fader, I'll hit channel one, and you'll see that it's now right in between your Q and your master. So that way you can hear your pre-fader for whatever channel it is, and you can hear your master output that's playing out into your live stream or to your audience. And when you turn the button off, you see it goes right back to 100% master, which makes sense because you don't have the Q buttons pressed. The same thing happens when I hit the channel 2 button for pre-fader or the channel 4 button, depending on which deck you're on. Same thing happens. Another functionality that the headphone buttons have that isn't written anywhere on here it was kind of by trial and error because I've seen this with other controllers that these buttons actually turn into the tapping for your beats per minute. 
If you want to get the beats per minute of a track that you're playing on your Serato DJ software, you would have to hold down the shift button and then tap whichever channel it is of the deck that you're trying to get the beats per minute for. So if I hold down the shift and tap the two button, I'll be able to get a beats per minute of whatever that track is. The same thing with this deck. So that's just a helpful little tidbit that I haven't seen mentioned anywhere. That's kind of a hidden Easter egg. It's something pretty useful because you don't have a tap feature anywhere. Speaking of the headphone section, one of the strange design choices that I found with this controller is this button over here to the top left. Now you look at that, that's actually your headphone volume control. Because I had the Newmark Mix Track Platinum effects, I thought that this was going to be a microphone volume output because that's exactly what the layout is on the Newmark Mix Track Platinum and the Newmark Mix Track effects. This was for that microphone input, which is in the rear. This isn't that. They put the headphone volume over here. I don't know why that is. I'm thinking maybe because a lot of battle DJs don't use headphones at all. They're kind of just doing their performance. So they figure that you just really need to hear what you're queuing up if you do. You don't really need a volume control, I guess. And now on the upper portion of the mixer section, you've got the EQ channels, your filter and trim for each channel. And the all important performance pads. These things are very small. They're more in line with the size that you found on the Rain TTM 57 MK2. Those have those small buttons up on the top, and I think these are about the same size. I don't have one on hand. The touch of the performance pads feels exactly how you'd expect. They're nice and velvety and smooth to the touch. The big news here is the things that they've added that were not on previous controllers. And one feature that actually works with Serato DJ Lite, the scratch bank feature, is accessible with Serato DJ Lite. And that's a pretty big deal because if you're just grabbing this controller and are unsure if you want to use it and you don't want to upgrade and pay the $100 for Serato DJ Pro, you can try it out with Lite and it's actually as useful with Lite as it is with Serato DJ Pro. And I'll get into how Scratch Bank works in a minute. We're gonna go all the way back to the Hot Q. Hot Q you set up like every other controller out there. You get whatever parts of the song that you wanna set a Q for and you hit the corresponding button. That way, anytime you hit that button, it'll trigger exactly where you wanted it to in the song. I find it kind of funny that underneath that Hot Q button, you have the beat jump feature which I always felt was kind of useless because I already had hot cues set up. So if I wanted to skip to a specific spot in the song, I would just hit the corresponding hot cue button. If you use Beat Jump, put a comment in the comment section below and let me know how you use it or what it would be useful for because I'm really curious as to how I can use this as a useful tool for myself if I'm doing a mix. There's probably something I'm missing there and I'm sure there's much better DJs out there than I am, much more creative, that know exactly what they can use this beat jump feature for, as opposed to just hitting a cue button. So if you want to set a hot cue, let's erase the one that I have here in front. Let's give us a blank slate. This way you can know how this works. I'm going to go all the way to my very first hot cue. I'm going to hold down the shift button, hit the hot cue button. You see that it's not lit up. That's letting you know that this particular slot is available for a hot cue. So if I want to reset the hot cue, as you see, there's nothing there now. I'm going to set it to a different point. So let's set it for right here. You just tap the button. Now you've got your hot cue set. Simple as that. This way you can do a lot of drumming with the pads and you can flip your own beat the way you want it. You can just do a quick on the fly remix if you want to do something like that. It's something, it sounds something like this. The very next feature is your auto loop feature. Now what's interesting here is that the auto loop on this is going to give you however many auto loops you have set up on your software. But 
you'll only get a 16 beat auto loop function with these buttons, which is odd because as you see now, I have this button lit, which means that it's gonna be a 16 beat loop. However, on the Serato DJ software, you can extend it to 32 beats per minute and it moves over what's on your screen. And let me show you what that looks like. You'll see this here where it says four, eight, 16, and 32. Now I moved it over. If I put it in its default setting, you're gonna see that this button here is lit up and that's giving me 16 beat loop. I'll hit the one next to it and it's gonna jump to an eight beat loop. You see that? If I move this over, so this way I can access the 32 beats, when I hit this last button, you'll see that it still stays at 16, even though the last button on the screen is 32. And it's gonna to continue to do that. So it doesn't actually correspond if you bring it all the way to 32 beats. So now I'm hitting the third button and you would expect the third button to be lit, but it's not, it moved down. So you can't access a 32 auto beat loop from the hardware itself, which is just an odd choice. I don't know why that is. I don't know if that's a mistake, but there are a couple of software mistakes with this controller, with features that are in this that you can't access if your controller's configured in a different way. And I'll show you what that is in a minute. This very first button is gonna be one eighth of a beat, no matter what you put on your Serato DJ screen. So you're gonna see that one eighth of a beat is actually the third button that's on that screen. You can still go 116th or 132. If you actually wanna trigger that, you would actually have to do it in the screen. You would have to scroll your cursor over and tap on your mouse or your trackpad in order to access that feature. So we're gonna set our auto loop. We know that this is gonna be a four beat loop. That's gonna be eight beat, that's gonna be 16. You're gonna have two beat, one beat, half beat, quarter beat, one eighth beat. So now we have a four beat loop. Eight beat loop. Pretty similar to what we ran into when we we're using the auto loop button up here. I much rather would have had that the roll was the top feature because I use the roll a lot and to have it underneath kind of messes with me. I don't really care for it. If I wanna go into the roll, I would hold down shift, touch the auto loop button, you see it's flashing. That means that this button is now using the feature that's written underneath what's on the button. If I wanna use the roll feature, I would hold down the shift button, tap the auto loop button, you see it's now flashing. Now this top row of buttons is gonna give you the amount of beat that your roll effect is gonna take place. And this will correspond to what's on your screen as I showed you earlier. So right now I have it set up to a one beat roll, two beat, four beat, eight beat. But if I move it on the software and move it down to a 1 16th of a beat, that means that this button will now be 1 16th, this will be a 1 8th, that'll be a quarter, that'll be a half beat, and that's more in line with what I use the roll feature for. So there's a little sample, just an example of how I can just kill a roll. The next button is something new that's on here that wasn't available before on a controller, and that's the tracking feature. Now, what the tracking feature does is that it's gonna track exactly where the beginning of your cue point is for, so while you're scratching, all you have to do is move the deck. It's actually gonna do some scratch patterns for you when you're in that mode. So on this side, if I have a sound, I'll go into tracking mode. It's gonna start right at the beginning of whatever the sound was I had as the start of my cue point. For example, let's do this. So it kind of sounds like cheating. It's kind of replacing the pad scratch feature that was on the SB3 that was kind of controversial. This is doing a lot of the same thing. Now this is where it gets interesting though. Each one of these pads here actually gives you a different scratch pattern. While I'm in tracking mode, I'll press whatever button corresponds to the pattern I'm trying to get. Now I have my crossfader in reverse. I have it in hamster mode. So this is where one of the problems is that I had. Whenever you're trying to trigger one of these patterns, the controller doesn't know how to access it. It starts to cut off the deck that's on this side that say your instrumental and the scratch. 
So let me show you how weird that is. So now if I want to do the scratch, you see how I still have the crossfader closed. Because I have my crossfader reversed, the crossfader comes this way to give me full volume for the left deck. And the opposite is true for the right deck. I have to push it to the left to get full volume. You see, I'm doing a scratch and you don't hear the beat. If I move the crossfader to the middle, you have the beat. And you can kind of hear, you can hear what it's doing to the beat. So it's actually triggering that effect for that. But if I put the turn, if I put the controller in normal mode, we're gonna go into the mixer section in Serato DDJ software. We're gonna touch the cog wheel in the corner. And right here, you'll see that it says reverse or disable. We're gonna turn off the reverse or we're gonna turn off hamster mode. And now the controller will work in the way it was intended. So this controller is hamster scratchist. It is discriminatory against hamster scratchers. It's trying to kill us all and eliminate every single hamster scratcher in the world, one controller at a time. So now I'll put it in the right way, in what quote unquote, the normal right way. Now if I go back to the scratch bank performance thing, watch. You don't hear anything, the beats. If I move the crossfader to the middle, you're gonna hear the scratch pattern for this button. The other patterns, you get a forward stab scratch. Now let's take a listen to what the second pattern is gonna be, and that's gonna be a reverse stab scratch. And now the third pattern is gonna be a different type of scratch. I don't even know what to call this one. I'm sure someone out there knows as soon as they hear it what it is, there'll be a battle or scratch DJ that's gonna know oh, it's, it's gonna be you know, the super duct table cloth atomic scratch. I don't know what the hell, there's so many names. Here's the third pattern on the tracking buttons. Then of course, number four is my favorite. Now pattern number five is a much more advanced pattern. And with that button, you're instantly scratch bastard. And then pattern number six. But chance, you aficionado of all fake scratching, what do these two buttons do, I hear you say? These actually adjust the speed control of those patterns. So if you want a slower type of that same pattern or a faster type, you would hit these buttons. The one on the left is for lessening the speed of that pattern, and the one on the right is for speeding up that pattern. Let's go back to scratch pattern four. Now let's hit the minus button. Now, without adjusting the speed of my hand movement, listen to how much faster the pattern is, which is mimicking a faster fader cut. Now, pattern number five in the fastest setting, it's I don't even know what to call it. It's like turbo uh, atomic nuclear light speed scratch. The odd thing is, is that the speed button doesn't affect patterns one, two, and six, which is weird. Why it skips over these three is odd. I guess because these two buttons have to control the speed, so they had to figure out a way to do that. But I feel like four and five 
should have been placed next to each other. They should have been five and six because number six is more of a basic scratch. I feel like that belongs next to the first two basic scratches. Instead of giving you a more advanced scratch than an even more advanced scratch, then the ultimate turbo nuclear light speed scratch and then a basic pattern that just seems odd to me that's an odd choice i feel like that was an afterthought like they found a scratch in their data bank and they were like oh wait 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 and then dude i already programmed it oh come on man let's just throw a, you know a comma dot semicolon into the software program and they just added it there but it doesn't affect these so watch i'll put on the little baby Mix Master Ice Scratch. Nothing happens there. Because they're basic patterns, you don't really need a fast crossfader movement. So, see, it doesn't affect that either. It doesn't affect two. So just something to be aware of. If you really want to pretend like you're the master scratcher, you know, you can stand there and, and do all of the hand movements and pretend you're getting busy, like a lot of footage that I see at festivals with DJs doing all these incredible things, and we all know that the set is already pre-made. No way! And all they're really doing is controlling, like, the filter. So that's definitely uh, something that's going to be controversial there. But, you know, maybe you're an older DJ that has carpal tunnel or golfers or a tennis elbow and you physically, it physically hurts to do a scratch. Well, now you can be the life of any DJ battle anywhere as long as the cameras are facing from the crowd and not above the controller. So have cameras that are set up in front of you facing you from this direction and at a lower angle and you just pretend to move your fingers across the crossfader to sound like you are the nastiest DJ in the area. It's crazy to me that this is even something because this is far more advanced than what was on the pad scratch feature of the SB3. The SB3 had just like some basic Jazzy Jeff scratches and you know, this pad number five button reminds me of a track from 1987 or 88, I think it was 87, that I never understood how the scratch was done because it was so many years advanced of an Autobahn or Orbit scratch, and I just never understood how it was done. And that song was by Mantronics. There's a song called Scream by Mantronics. And there's a part in it where the rapper goes Mantronic rock the beat and then Mantronic does a scratch with this sound, of course. And it sounds a lot like this. But the scratch just sounds so perfect and so digital. I always felt like he programmed that scratch, that it wasn't an actual scratch. I could be wrong. He could have been way ahead of his time and he was just uh, underrated. Nobody caught it back then because nobody knew what the hell it was. Okay, now that you're back from looking at that Mantronic video, take a minute to think about the time period when that scratch took place and the equipment that was available. The best scratch mixer you could get at that time was like a Newmark DM500 and of course the iconic Gemini MX2200. Those didn't even have a crossfader curve adjustment. Whatever your crossfader curve was when you bought a mixer, that's what you had to deal with. And back then, those weren't intended for scratching. They were more mixing controllers or disco mixers, a lot of them would say. It is what it sounds like. I can't even mimic it even with this. Cause Peter, you suck. Peter, you suck. Now underneath the tracking feature, you've got the transformer effect. Which makes sense that they put both of the like effects in there, kind of like they did with Hot Q and Beat Jump. So I'm going to hold down the shift button, I'm going to hit the tracking button, you're going to see it light up. And now it's in transformer mode. And now let's hit one of these buttons to give us a transformer scratch. Transform.
nothing seems to happen with the 8 button. If we're going to do the transformer, we have to use the iconic transformer sound. So let's get it. That one right there sounds like when you got to the end of a bad CD and there was a lot of scratches and fingerprints and the CD just started to do that sound in your car. All right, the very next button that we have here is the sampler button. Now the sampler does exactly what it says. This is where you set whatever samples you're gonna play out to the crowd. Now you can load whatever you want here. You can load sound effects. You can put entire tracks in the sampler right there. Whatever you feel like loading into the sampler. So we'll touch the sampler button. We'll have my samples that are loaded in here. DJ Chan. DJ Chan. The only thing to be aware of is that you have no control over the volume for your samples. So whatever sample volume you had going into your gig, that's exactly the volume that these are going to play at. So if you want to adjust the volume for your specific samples, you're going to have to do it in the Serato DJ software on the screen. This way, if I'm playing a beat and I hit one of my samples, You see, like the ooh-ooh right there was kind of overpowering to the rest of the beat. So if I want to adjust that, I would go into my software. And let me show you where you do that. So what you would do is, is click on the reggae horn, is click on the air horn symbol right there. You click on that, and that'll open up some boxes right here. And as you can see, it says DJ Chance, DJ Chance, that giant creature with the monkey and then the thing that befriended a, a blue dinosaur. And you can see if you want to set the volumes, it's got little faders here. You would actually move them up and down. You'd hold down your trackpad and then you would just move the cursor with that. There's also a master volume all the way. You can actually mute all of your samples. So if you don't want to trigger any of them accidentally, or you can control the volume right here next to it. Same thing, you would hold down your trackpad or your mouse and then you would bring the volume up and down. And now the big feature here, the all important feature is the scratch bang feature. For them to place this as kind of an underneath effect, that feels kind of weird, but you do have it here. The reason I'm excited about scratch bang is because you can take whatever you want to do as a performance. If you're a battle DJ, you're a scratch DJ, and you've got a, a whole routine figured out, you can load all of your sounds into these pads. You would hold down the shift. See the sampler button is flashing. Now it doesn't even have to be the same track. This will load anything that you have. So if you have eight different songs here, or eight different battle records with eight different samples from each one, you can trigger them instantly as long as the playing track is stopped. So let me show you what I mean. So now I'm gonna hit the very first button. It's gonna trigger whatever scratch sound that I had loaded into my software. I wonder what sound effect that could possibly be. <gasps> What, what is this sound? I've never heard a DJ use this effect. This is crazy. This is ludicrous. I never heard this before. This is amazing. What is this sound? And now as long as it's not playing, I can trigger the next one. What's interesting here as well is that whatever you triggered here, whatever sound effect or track you got, whatever sound effect you're using or drum beat, it's actually going to show up in your software loaded as that track on the whatever deck. So you see I have the scratch sound. I'm going to show you my screen. See my screen there says the most famous scratch sound is how I have it labeled. Now check this out. Then I'm going to hit my second loaded scratch bank sound. Now I hit this. Let's get, Let's get started. You may learn something. If I go back to my software, you see it says Rectangle Break because that's a DJ Rectangle record. So it's really cool. So now because the song is paused, actually if I play it, 
take a listen. If I play it, I can't load a different scratch. So see, I'm, I'm gonna try to load a different one and I can't do it. But as long as the track is stopped or I'm holding it with my hand, I can load the next thing. And you see, it changed the name of the track again, even though I'm just using my scratch bank. So, All right, now let's get into the effects section of the DDJ Rev 1. The first thing you're probably gonna notice is that they've added these toggle switches. So this way you can trigger your effects. If you switch it upward, you're gonna be able to lock your effect on. You won't have to touch that switch while you're doing your performance. Or if you wanna do a quick one hit of whatever effect you're using, you can just slap it into the down position really quickly. Right next to that, you have your level and depth knob, which controls the volume of your effect and the depth of that effect. Underneath that, you're gonna have your FX trigger switches, which give you three different banks of three different effects. What this allows you to do is to trigger three separate effects that you have set up in your Serato DJ software, or you can layer effects one on top of the other. The only thing you don't have an ability to do is to adjust the amount of depth or attack or whatever adjustment parameters you need to adjust for each individual effect. You would have to set that up in the Serato DJ software before you trigger the effects here. If you hold down the shift button, while you hit one of these three effect switches, you're going to be able to adjust the actual effect that you wanna choose for button number one. If I press down shift and press button number one, I'm gonna get a drop down menu in my Serato DJ software. Let me show you what that looks like. I'll get the drop down menu right here because this will be button number one, that would be button number two, that's button number three in the effects section. If I hold down shift and hit that select button, you see I get a drop down menu right there. And when you press the button another time, you're gonna be able to go through each effect that you wanna use, but it's only for that particular button. You can't use it for any of these other two. Now what button number two and three allow you to do when you hold down shift is to adjust the beat of your effect. So if you wanna have a one beat, echo or you want to have a one beat delay or a two beat delay, you can adjust that by holding down the shift button and pressing one of the two corresponding buttons to adjust that beat. Let me show you what that looks like on the screen for the Serato DJ software. All right, you'll notice right here it says beats. So if I were to hold down the shift button and the number two button, you're gonna see that beat switch to now it's half a beat because it's going down when you hit the number two button and it goes up when you hit the number three button. So now my effect can be a one beat effect or a two beat effect, four beat, eight beat. And you see it goes all the way down to 1 16th of a beat. In the Serato DJ software, you're gonna have these three dots here in this one dot. And what that's doing is giving you the configuration model of what's happening in your effects section. Those three buttons right now are showing you three different effects. If you press on the one dot button, that's gonna adjust the in three different parameters for one single effect. So if we go to the trackpad here on my MacBook and I hit that one little dot, you'll see now that it's at this effect, it's at the reverb, and now we have three different ways in which to adjust that particular effect underneath that one dot. And if I hold down the shift button and the one button in this configuration, you see I still get that drop down menu. So I can pick which effect I want to adjust these three parameters for. And you see that the drop down menu automatically goes away within about a second or two after releasing the shift button. So now I can adjust the on and off button. I can adjust the low frequency oscillation here and I can adjust the waveform that I wanna use for this particular low pass frequency. Now when you use the level and depth knob on the controller, it's only going to affect the very first adjustment that you have set in this one dot configuration. So you're gonna see as I turn that knob, it's only turning on the very first on and off. So it's basically controlling the volume of it. If you wanna adjust any of these other parameters here like this one or this one, you would have to actually go to your trackpad and adjust it manually by hand. So I would press on it like this with the cursor and then go up and down and you can see that it's adjusting the way that the low frequency oscillation is gonna work for this particular effect. And if we pick any other effect, let's say we go back up to an echo, we can adjust the reverse feedback and we can adjust the high, the high pass frequency cutoff and turning the loop of the effect on. 
Let me give you a quick sample of what some of these effects sound like. In my effects section, button number one, I use a flanger, and button number two is my delay, and button number three is my epic reverb. Now the flanger is pretty much the jet sound, which is what Pioneer used to call it when it was on the CDJ100S way back in the day, or if you had it on the EFX500 or the EFX1000, it used to be known as the jet effect. And it sounds like this. I'm gonna press the effect button, and now I'll hit the lock on button. You hear that effect right there? If I adjust the parameters in the Serato DJ software and do say half a beat effect, it sounds like this. Now I'm gonna do button number two, which is my favorite effect and that's the delay. And it sounds something like this. And once you turn the button off, you'll hear the effect goes away immediately. So let's listen to that again. Let's do the delay really quickly. And you see, as soon as I hit the button again, the effect goes away instantly. Now I have my epic reverb. To layer the effects, I would hit two buttons at once. In this particular case, I'm layering my delay effect and my epic reverb. We're gonna hit the toggle switch down to get the one hitter effect. If you want to layer all three effects, you just hit all three buttons at once. And you can adjust the level and depth of that effect instantly with the knob. You see there's no effect, so even if you leave the lock feature on for a future effect use, you can use the switch if you're more used to the rotary effect that was on, kind of like the SX model or the SZs, you can spin the rotary for it. Turn the switch and it goes bye bye. The one thing to be aware of when you're using this level and depth knob is that it's going to equalize all of the volumes of all the effects that you're trying to use at once. Let me show you what that looks like on the Serato DJ software. You can see that I have all three effects lit up here on the Serato DJ software. And now what you're gonna notice is all three volumes are gonna move in the same manner when I turn that level and depth knob. You see they're all equalizing at the very same volume. Which is why if you want to adjust the different parameters for these, you can do it here and adjust the separate parameters. And that way, when you trigger the effect, you can have them just the way you want. They don't necessarily have to sound the way they come from the factory. On the rear of the controller, you can see that you have your master RCA outs, you have your USB port, and you have your microphone input which has the volume control in the rear. I've always hated that any company has done this. I much preferred what Newmark did by adding the mic volume right here. This being a headphone volume just feels stupid to me. I feel like this should have just stayed as a microphone control. If you're trying to adjust your mic, you have to reach over and get it just right. You don't really see where the volume is. You kind of have to adjust on the fly as you're talking. The problem that you can have with this in a live environment is if you have multiple DJs that go on and one of the DJs has a more powerful commanding voice than another DJ, when they come on and turn their microphone on, let's say the microphone has an on off switch and they're not reaching back here, what's gonna happen is as soon as they hit that on and off switch, you may get feedback because it may be too sensitive of a setting for that particular DJ's voice. He may be further away from the microphone than the other DJ, so you have the potential for feedback issues with this being in the rear here. Now I understand that this is more of a scratch DJ based controller, so microphone use is probably more of an afterthought because you don't find many scratch battle DJs trying to hype up a crowd. That's more for mobile DJ use. You also have your cable lock feature, which is back here. Adding it kind of made it seem like it'd be something you need, but listen, man, if somebody's at a gig and they decide to grab this thing and walk away, everyone's going to know about it because the music's going to go away. If someone has the cojones to actually do that, I think they deserve to take this controller. On the front panel, there's nothing here of note. The only thing is that they've put the headphone jack off to the side. It makes more sense that it's off to the side because if you're trying to do body tricks or trying to do a lot of battle movements, 
having a headphone jack in the middle like you did in the SB3 is just more of a hindrance. Your back is going to hit that, your arms may hit it, your chest may hit it. I mean, hell, if you're of a more robust DJ with, say, a bigger mid area, maybe you don't have a six pack, maybe it's more like a kegger, your belly may hit that headphone jack. That could be an issue as well. So it was good attention to detail. So far, that's the tutorial of everything I've learned how to do with this controller in the two weeks of ownership that I've had it. Hopefully you've found something useful in this video, but maybe you have some tips and tricks for me or things you've learned, or maybe there's something I missed or there's something you wanna learn a little more in depth. Just put the comments in the comment section below. Put your links to your videos. Let me know any helpful tips you have. I would love to see it. Thank you for watching everyone. I'm really appreciative of all the love and support and positivity I've been receiving on this channel and the comment sections of my other videos. I'm gonna see you in the next video. Now that you've learned more about this controller, go out there, master, and make money.